in the first chapter. And I, I, we talked about the, just a little introduction to it last week. And uh, uh, that was a letter from Paul as he wrote to Timothy, a young man in the faith. He said a true son in the faith. And we know that he wasn't really uh, Paul's uh, biological son, but he was considered as a son in the sense that Paul had took him under his wing uh, to uh, train him and teach him and lead him. And uh, so he became a, a great preacher, I understand, for the Lord Jesus and uh, did a great work. And he is at Ephesus right now, and Paul writes a letter to him as he preaches and ministers to the church at Ephesus, okay? And so that's where he is, and there's some problems going on there, and uh, some, uh, some people teaching things they ought not teach and doing things they shouldn't do, and, and he's trying to encourage uh, uh, Timothy to be strong and be courageous and preach and teach, and he says, charge those, uh, charge those who... Uh, teach other doctrines, you know, not to teach other doctrines. He says, charge some that they teach no other doctrines. So there were some doctrines being taught that were contrary to sound doctrine, okay? So as a young man, uh, I, I suppose a young single man at that, that he didn't, uh, uh, you know, he was young, and it's, it's, it's a little on the difficult side uh, to uh, work with a congregation when you're young and don't have maybe a lot of the experience to work with people. And uh, you got a whole house full of people from different walks of life and different concepts and opinions and, and all of that, and you're going to try to teach them. And you got to be careful how you teach the older folks. You've got to treat them with respect uh, as you teach them uh, as a young person like that. And we'll see that as we go along in this study uh, about uh, you know not to rebuke an older man and an uh, 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 elderly man or women or this and that, be respectful and all that. And so as a young man, sometimes you may want to get a little bit disrespectful, <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, you have to understand that uh, you're talking to older people that have been down the road and you need to show respect no matter what. And yeah, sometimes you have to rebuke and correct, but nevertheless, uh, you, you need to show respect as much as possible to each and every person in order to win their uh, approval and influence uh, them towards Jesus Christ. So what I want to talk about this morning in, in verse 5, and we'll just read verse 5 uh, down through uh, uh, verse uh, 8, okay? He says here in the first chapter, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, uh, from which some having strayed have turned aside to idle talk, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor uh, the things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. And we'll get into studying on the law part next week. But I want to deal with these uh, three, uh, I think, three very important issues there that he brought up uh, in this uh, fifth verse. And I want to talk about that a little bit. And I think there's a lot to say about that. And uh, first of all, he says, now, the, the, the purpose of the commandment. I just want to say, as we start off, the commandments of God were given for a purpose, okay? It's not just idle talk on God's part. It's not God just trying to have a conversation with the church. When God speaks, God speaks in such a way as he has all authority. We know he gave that to Jesus. And so what we need to understand that God, when he speaks, he speaks for a purpose, okay? He's not just talking. Uh, like we do sometimes, uh, but he speaks because of a purpose. And every commandment has a purpose. When he commands, he commands for a certain reason or purpose that we may gain understanding, that we may gain uh, 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 what we need to, that we may need to grow, may have a better understanding of God, a better understanding of Christianity, a better understanding of salvation. So when God speaks he, and, and gives commandment, his commandments have a purpose. You know, Jesus said on one occasion that uh, he, he, says, he says, strive to enter the straight gate. He says, for wide is the great uh, uh, gate and broad is the way which leadeth to destruction. And he said, many there be which go in thereat. But he says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life and there are few that find it. And so what we need to understand is God gives commandments to guide us, okay, and direct us in such a way as we can come to know salvation. 
that we can have that salvation, but it's within the straight and narrow way. It's not in the wide and broad way, which leads to destruction. So God gives us commandments to help us and to direct us in a way of righteousness and true holiness. You know, in Proverbs 14, verse 12 uh, the Hebrew or the writer will say, not the Hebrew, but I'm talking about Solomon will say, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now these are the ways sometimes we try to live by our own opinions and our own thoughts and, and what we think is right or what somebody else thinks is right and this and that. And as a result of that, we may think they're right, but religiously speaking, they may be wrong. We need to understand that God is right and his word is truth, and we need to understand to accept his word as truth and his commandments as that which is best for us, okay? That which we need. God just directs us in a way and in those things that we need in order to have that spiritual life and that forgiveness of our sins. Jesus will also say in Matthew 7, 21, he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. It says, that, that, that day some was saying to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name uh, uh, done uh, cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And he will say, depart from me, I don't know you. You know, the idea is people living by opinion or what they think is right is not always right. We need to understand and let, our, let God guide our lives through his word. And if we do, we know we're going to be in the straight and narrow. We know we're going to have eternal life if we follow the teaching of God and surrender ourselves into obedience to that teaching. And I think that's a wonderful thing, and we need to recognize that and realize that God's commandments are for a purpose. There is a purpose behind everything that God teaches. And that purpose basically overall is your salvation, our salvation, through Jesus Christ, his son. You know, the Bible says in uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So when you stop and think about that, all scripture being inspired of God and it's for our correction and reproof. It's to lead us and to guide us and teach us how we need to live in that straight and narrow way if we desire that salvation that is given to us in Christ. Second Peter 1, 3. Peter says basically the same thing. He says, according to his divine power, he hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who hath called us to glory and virtue. So he is simply saying everything that pertains to life and godliness, God has given us that through the knowledge of him, by revealing himself and the truth as he has given through his commandments. His truth is commandments, so we need to understand that and not just take it as, well, uh, he said this, uh, but, you know, uh, is, that a, is that a big thing? Yes, it is a big thing when God speaks. It always has been. Matter of fact, when he went up on the mountain, he spoke to the children of Israel, and they all gathered around that mountain. And when he spoke, that was it. And they were so frightened. They said, they told Moses, you go up there, and you get the commandments, and you bring them back to us. And basically what they're saying, but don't let him speak. You know, they were so afraid that the speaking of God, like a great thunder, uh, if you will, and it really, uh, they really frightened them, and they didn't want to hear directly from God. And I don't think you would either if God spoke to us again today in that way. You talk about being afraid. That would be something we'd be absolutely afraid of, would it not? <laughs> yes. But his, God's commands are, are for our good. It's for our benefit. It's to bless us. It's to help us uh, to... Uh, uh, to be acceptable and to be living the kind of life that God has called us to do. You know, but so many people live by opinions. You know, like on Sunday, some would say, oh, I'd just rather go out here to the woods and kick back under this big old shade tree, you know, and just look at the world and just relax and enjoy that and think about God and this and that, as if that's sufficient. I'm not saying there wouldn't be some kind of warm feeling from it. Maybe you'd feel good about doing that, but you have not obeyed God. On the first day of the week when you go out and you sit under a big shade tree and you thank God for all of his blessings. 
God has a purpose for us on the first day of the week on Sunday, and that is to come together for worship as a body of, of believers, as a body uh, 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 of those who believe in Christ and who are Christians. We are called to come together. And you'll find that in Hebrews, and we'll talk about that just a little later. But I want, I want to talk to you about something else, a, a source of opinion and that kind of thing. Otherwise, we, we look at something and we think, well, uh, uh, this way is okay, but we know that it may be the way of death, especially when you're thinking about spiritual things. That is spiritual death, okay? So think about this here. You know, if you, uh, if you walked into the airport and you said, uh, uh, give, me a, give me a ticket, I want to fly somewhere. And they say, well, okay, where do you want to go? And we'll, we'll see what flight we can put you on and we can see what we can do there. And you say, it don't matter. Just give me a ticket. I just want to go. You know, and they're going to say, I can't do that. I have to know where you're going to go and the flight you need to take and the time that you leave, the time you arrive and all of that. I can't just give you a ticket, just get on a plane and take off. Who knows where? And some people think that's kind of how it is with Jesus. Long as you believe, it really doesn't matter. Long as you know that Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, nothing else really matters. But you know yourself, if you were going to take a flight or go on a vacation somewhere, you would go in and you would, you would look up all of that on your computer probably and find out where to go and when to leave and when you're going to arrive, uh, how much it's going to cost, a round trip ticket, you're going to make reservations at hotels and, and all of that. You're going to mark down the places you want to go, the things you want to see and, and, and all of the experience that you want to try to gather from that trip and really enjoy that. And so you make all of those arrangements before you take off so you know you're going to get what you pay for. That you know you're going to get to do what you intend to do. And rather than just walking in and say, give me a ticket somewhere, it doesn't matter. No. That's not, that's not Christianity. Christianity is understanding the rules and the commandments that God gives us and making plans to obey those. Putting yourself in a position to keep the commandments of God, to obey the commandments of God, to walk in that straight and narrow way. And that takes time. We have to think about that. We have to pray about that. We have to do our very best to read and study the Word of God and find out what that is that God wants us to do, especially on the Lord's Day. How do we worship God? Do we worship God just any way we want to? And another thing, you know, what, what if you're going to take a trip here, uh, uh, here in Oklahoma and you want to go to New York City or somewhere? So what do you usually do? You check all that out, right? You get you. GPS out your Garmin or whatever, and you set that address in there where you're going to go. It's going to tell you what roads to take, and it's going to tell you how, how many hours of driving it's going to take, how, and, and how many miles you're going to go, and all of that, and it'll direct you. You know, I don't know if you ever use those or not, or your phone or whatever, and you're going down the road, and you pass that street up you're supposed to turn on. What do they say? Oh, on the next intersection turn. <laughs> what do they do? They'll do their best to get you back to that street and you missed it and they're not going to settle for it. They'll just keep on till you go back to that street and turn on that right street. But it'll get you right where you want to go uh, and you'll be right there. That's direction. That's the GPS. This word of God is a GPS. This is our GPS to get us to heaven right here. It will give us the direction. It will tell us what God expects for us to do, how he expects us to live, and the things that we need to do during our lives, okay? And, and, and we need to understand that. And if we open up the word of God and keep studying and keep learning, we'll know that we have eternal life. And we'll know that we're going to go to heaven when we pass this life because we're doing the will of God. And no one is perfect, but we know God forgives to those who seek to please him and serve him. So, you know, it, it, Christianity is not just something you can do any way you want to, anytime you want to do it, wherever you want to do it, and it really doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter. It ma matters uh, immensely on how we live our lives and how we live together as people. Notice what he said there in that verse 5. And he says, the commandment is love out of a pure heart. You know, that word love there is the word agape. Okay, that word agape is used mostly for God, but nevertheless, it is also used in many of the places where we talk about brotherly love, which is phileo, but nevertheless, it's used, agape is used in many of those places. 
that we love each other with agape love. That's pure love. That's supreme kind of love. That's a divine kind of love, the kind of love that God has for you and me when he gave his son on the cross. That was divine love, sacrificial love. And that's what he's talking about here. The commandment is love out of a pure heart. No hypocrisy involved in that. In Romans 12, verse 9, Paul would say, let love be without hypocrisy. Otherwise, let it be real. Let it be genuine. Let it be true. Let it be exactly what it should be. Let it be like that of God. God is not hypocritical in all of his promises and all of his love that he shows toward us. God is honest and true. And God uh, is, is uh, you know, his love for us is, is profound and his love for us is sacrificial and he's willing to do whatever needs to be done to save our souls if we're willing to cooperate with him. And he will bring us to salvation. You know, in, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, you read, you read where he says, talking about various things about how great love is, agape love how it sacrifices and, and all of that. When you get down to that last verse, uh, and 13, verse 13, and he says, And now abideth faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love is greater than faith. Love is greater than hope. But it doesn't mean you don't need faith and hope, but it means love supersedes all of that. Love is the greatest aspect, the greatest virtue for the Christian. And we need to have that love for one another as Christians. And, and, and it's so important that we do. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. And so this is the way the world recognizes, if you will, if you will recognizes God's people from the people of the world because we're those people who love people and we love the souls of people, not just people, but the souls of people. And we want to help people to understand that and to know salvation and to bring them to salvation and do what we can to help people understand that. But God's commandments, uh, you know, another thing is God's commandments are not grievous, are they? You know, Paul will say, I mean, not Paul, I'm sorry, John will say in 1 John, uh, I believe verse 5, verse 3, he says, uh, this is the will of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Are they or not, in the, in the New King James, they're not burdensome. Same thing. They're not grievous and not burdensome. No, they're really not because they bring the blessing of eternal life to us. And, and it's a blessing. Uh, and when we stop and think about the congregation of the church, when we think about the body of Jesus Christ, how that we're all united together as one in Jesus, and we're all just people, but we're the body of Jesus Christ. You know, and I was thinking about this morning, and not to, not to say anything uh, uh, that might embarrass anyone, but I, I want to say this. I want to say this. You know, the body of Jesus Christ, that we need to be encouraging one another all the time, of course, and doing what we can, praying for one another, and, and all of that because it's so essential uh, for our well-being and our unity as uh, believers in Jesus. And I, I, I just want to, I was thinking about Brother Yule this morning, I was thinking, you know, you know, he puts out these calls for us. I mean, you call him anytime you want to. And he'll take, and, and uh, if it's not real, real late in the night or whatever, he puts out these calls and he tells us about someone that's in the hospital that needs our prayers or someone is taken to the emergency room and needs our prayers or for this or for this assignment or, or whatever it's going to be, our church is going to meet for this or whatever. And he puts these calls out all the time like that. I want to tell you what, he is doing more by putting those calls out than anyone else probably in this church to keep the body of Jesus Christ together and united together doing the things of God. Keeping us informed. Helping us to know what's going on with all of our brothers and sisters. Getting those prayers going to God when someone's on the way to the emergency room rather than after they get there. That kind of thing is very important. And that's a great work. It's an elder doing an elder's job. Okay. I just felt like I had to say something to you about that, brother. He's doing a great work. And I, I truly appreciate it. And I, I want you to know that. But, you know, because we are to consider one another 
uh, and, and, and provoke one another to love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Okay? We ought to assemble together and come together and stay together as a body of believers. Christianity is not a single thing. Okay? We think sometimes, and the world does, that Christianity is just a thing that's all about me. You know, as long as I'm believing in the Lord, I'm okay. Everything's okay. I don't need the church, and I don't need all those folks that go down there and all that stuff that they do. I don't need none of that stuff. All I need is to believe in Jesus, and that's good enough. And they miss the whole program. They miss the, they miss the commandments of God. They miss, they miss the great purpose of God. And the church that the Bible says, Jesus, Paul said that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. How can you, be, how can you have Jesus and the blood of salvation without being in the church? He purchased the church with his blood. That was the design of Jesus dying on the cross, shedding his blood for the forgiveness of our sins so he could have a church, if you will. And it's not burdensome. Is it, is it a burden to come to church on Sunday or to miss the services? You don't know, stop and think about it. If you, if you attended all the services usually, normally, it's about four hours a week for the services where we meet together. And that's not bad out of 168 hours, is it? Huh? Can you give God four hours? Can we give God four hours, just come together and study the Bible and visit and talk and, and uh, sing a few songs and praise the Lord and just enjoy being together as brothers and sisters? Can we work that in our schedule? Sometimes we have to make a schedule and we just have to purpose it. And I know some are that way and you've done that all your lives and you've done that and it's just an automatic thing when, when it comes time to go to services you may just come in from work but you just start getting ready to go because it's automatic with you, you know, because you've done that so many times and you're just here and I, that's, not for, that's not saying you know there's not sickness and there are not other situations that sometimes get in our way I'm not saying that but I, I'm just saying normally we can get up and go I heard a guy saying this morning he said, and, and, and so many make excuses, you know, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I just don't want to go or I'm lazy. And some are really honest about it. No, I'm just too lazy. I don't want to get up and go to church. It doesn't mean they can't. They just mean, I don't want to. But we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of, of some is, but exhorting one another. You see, Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. And he said, on this rock, I will build my church. And he adds every saved person to the church, Acts 2.47. So we're members of the body of Christ. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 12. And he talks about the members. And he says, you know, some are, eye, some are like an eye of a body. Some are like ears. Some are like uh, uh, hands and, and feet and, and all of that. And that's what makes up our body. I got hands, I got eyes, I got feet, you know, I got a mouth, I got ears, I got a nose, and all of that. And that helps me to have a body that's uh, a functional, that can do what needs to be done. Because God has given me all of these parts to be able to do that. And that's the way the church is. He puts all the saved in the church, and we come together, and we all are a member, many members, yet one body. So Somebody is a hand, somebody is a foot, somebody is an eye, somebody is a mouth, somebody is an ear, etc. in that concept, okay? Otherwise, there is a purpose for you within the body of Jesus Christ. But you know, what would you do today? You just said, oh, I got two eyes, I don't need that one. And you just pluck it out. Ah, I don't need that. You wouldn't want to do that, would you? You say, I've got two hands, I only need one. Look at that. Look at all them fingers. Just cut some of them off. I don't need all that. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't get rid of one of your, uh, your legs or your foot because uh, you got two. You could hop around, get your crutch, you know. You wouldn't do that. You want every member of your body to be functional, to be healthy, to be able to use for whatever you need, and that's the way the church needs to be. We need every member in the body of Jesus Christ to be functional to be a part of the congregation so we can function as a spiritual body in Jesus Christ. And I want you to know you are worth something in the church. 
I don't care who you are, how old you are, or what is, you are worth something to the congregation of the Lord. Your very presence, your very presence is encouraging. Your very presence. And we, we need to understand that, brothers and sisters. I'm just saying, you know, the, the first commandment he talks about here is the commandment of love out of a pure heart. And all of this is about love. It's about loving one another, appreciating one another, being thankful for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And really, not just as brothers and sisters as if it's some kind of a physical fellowship, but it's a spiritual fellowship. So we together assume this great spiritual uh, uh, concept of the church as we unite together with all of our various uh, abilities and, and uh, talents and all of that all working together to glorify God in heaven and, and, and to show uh, the world who God really is by the way that we're living and serving and worshiping God and, and uh, doing those kinds of things. And it, it's, a, it's a wonderful thought when you think about it, but when you think about love as he talks about here, it, it, you know, it's something we grow in. You know, uh, you, the first time you saw your wife, you, you probably didn't love her right off instantly, or your husband, you didn't just love him off instantly. But as you began to get acquainted, we spent a little more time together, a little more visiting together, you realize, hey, this is not just... Uh, Yeah, otherwise, and now you're thinking, hey, this is real love here. I, I feel it. I, I got it. You know, I got, I got to have this woman for my wife, or I got to have this man for my husband. I, 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 that's what's just the way it is. But you grow into that, and then that's just the beginning of that relationship, though. You know, as you continue to go, you just develop a greater love and a greater appreciation for each other. And, and pretty soon it's just, I can't live without you. 59 years ago, Louisa and I were in Fisher. We were trying to talk to her daddy and let me and Louisa get married in 1964. And Dewey won't talk to me about sex, okay? So we went out on the porch. He said, But you're a married daughter, boy. I said, I love you. He said, I, You don't know what love is. He said, After you've been with me 50 years, then you know what love is. He said, He's absolutely right. But he finally said, Okay. Well, uh, well, sometimes we, you know, we think love just being sweety, nicey, just lovey kind of thing, you know. Well, that, that, that's a part of it, love. But love is really caring and wanting the best for that individual Amen. that you love. I mean, you, you want the best for that person. I think everybody gets uh, rude. Huh? I think everybody gets rude with rude that. Yeah. Yeah. We're all mature adults. I tell you what, though, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, I, when I when I first saw my wife, I think I was in love that first night I met her. <laughs> you know, and of course it grew. You know, and, and some months later we, we got married. But I I, I think I, I think the first night that I met her, I, I said, man, I just you know, that's the one I wanted right there. And uh, of course I didn't realize uh, you know the importance of all that. But uh, at the time I said. You know, and sometimes it's that way. You know, love at first sight, they say, I, th I think that can happen. But most of the time, real love is when you really grow together and you become, what did Jesus say? One, uh, we become one flesh, you know. When you really become one, uh, that's, when, that's when it's really there, you know. And so you're, you're going to make the sacrifices and do the things that need to be done uh, to show your love and, and all that. And so... I, and I believe that's how it is in the church, isn't it? Uh, if you never come to services, it won't be too awful long and we're pretty much going to forget about you. Isn't that true? I mean, it's not that we totally forget about a brother or sister that never comes or anything, but we, we get to where we just we, we get occupied with the members who do come and we get involved in that and, they, and we just sort of, we just sort of forget those that are not coming anymore. It's not that we wish bad or anything like that. It's just out of sight, out of mind. It is, that's the way I am anyway. So if it's out of sight, I can't remember it anyway. But, but isn't that true? 
But, and that's why the fellowship, you see, that's why the pulling together, that's why the being here as brothers and sisters, so we don't lose that. So we can love and, and appreciate and pray for and encourage each and every one in the Lord. Because if we just drop out, we're soon forgotten. And I'm not saying that's good. I'm just saying that's human nature, isn't it? It's human nature. And, and uh, we don't want it to be that way, but it, it turns out to be that way. And it, it, it's uh, really sad indeed. And I don't know what we could do, but there ought to be things we could do to make it better. You know, and things we could do to keep in contact even with those who uh, are not able to be here. Uh, you know, we've, we've uh, uh, visited a lot of folks that are in the nursing homes, you know, been there for years. And we'd go by, you know, once a month. Or I remember we used to go down here and make pies and take them down there once a month, I think it was. Other uh, churches were involved in that too. I'm not saying those kind of things, but I'm just saying if we have a brother or sister or more or whatever uh, in there, uh, uh, we need maybe some kind of a little program going so once uh, every month or every two weeks we're down there to visit with them a little bit and uh, sing a few songs and just kind of encourage them you know. otherwise so we don't lose them out of our minds we don't lose praying for them we don't lose uh, uh, understanding what their needs are and, and things of that nature so there's a lot of things like this we can do that it seems like we did a lot more uh, back when but it seems like we've lost out on a lot of those things now. We're just not doing what we used to do. And I know COVID and a lot of other things got in the way of uh, things that we were doing. But we need to get back into the groove and, and do a little bit more and really show that love that we have for God and for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And show that love that we have for mankind. Anyone, anyone we can show love to and uh, encourage and help and, and all of that kind of thing. We need to be doing that. But... Uh, you know, I I, uh, I, I know we, we all fall short of that. Uh, I do, and I, I admit that. And, uh, and we should all try harder. Here's what I want to bring to your attention before we close out, okay? Uh, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, and let's read the uh, first four verses of that. He says this, <clears throat> Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and if thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and has labored, uh, has borne and has patience, and uh, for my name's sake, and has labored and uh, has not fainted, but hear him now. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Huh? Now, Timothy is here. At Ephesus, okay? There are problems going on here at Ephesus in the church at Ephesus right here. And uh, Paul is writing to him. He leaves Timothy there to help set things in order, to ordain elders and various other things that he needs to be teaching and to and all of this here. And, and, and what's happening some years later, uh, the Revelation letter looks over the church at Ephesus as well as the other six. And he says... The Lord says, you've got a problem. You turn from your first love. Otherwise, it's just sort of waned in their maybe affection and their, for God and their service uh, for one another and their encouragement. Uh, don't know really what happened, but they were working. They were laboring. They were doing things. But they turned from the first love. I know in Acts uh, 19th chapter, you can read about the church at Ephesus. Paul spent two years there uh, preaching and teaching. He spent, actually, he spent about three years. He spent longer, uh, more time there at the church at Ephesus than he did anywhere else. But there, at Ephesus and all of these other churches were pretty much local churches within, you know, 100 miles or so that you read about Colossians and all these others. And so uh, he, he kept preaching because 
he has so many people coming and going, you know, through business and, and all of that and, and commercial, uh, uh, it was a commercial seaport and all that. So there's so many people coming and going. He stayed there and preached for about three years at Ephesus and did a great work there, what he was doing there. But uh, then after he got out of prison on that first term, he came and he told Timothy, you stay here and you work with the church at Ephesus. And so, because there's some problems there, they're teaching things what they ought not teach. And he says, you stay there and, and charge them not to do that. Otherwise, correct these problems that are going on because they're going to get worse. And evidently, they did get worse. And pretty soon, they turned from their first love. They just kind of lost that, perhaps that fellowship, that communion, that desire to be with one another, that uh, spiritual fellowship that they were drawing from one another or not getting anymore. Did you draw a spiritual fellowship from your brothers and sisters in Christ? We do, do we not? You know, just the idea that for one thing that you're here and you, you draw, you know, a spiritual encouragement from that. It's not just because I can see you with my eyes, you know, but there's just something about the fact that you're here. And I think that's true with all of us. You're here. That's what really counts. You're here as members of the body of Christ. And you wouldn't be here if you didn't want to be here. But you're here because you want to be. And that's, I think, those things I think are so important. And we need to, to understand that. And we need to have that love that he's talking about as he commands you. That love from a pure heart. Pure heart. I don't know. Is that hard to get? Is that hard to achieve? That pure heart. I think it is sometimes. And sometimes we have people that. Uh, even brothers in the church, you know, uh, that we don't always agree with, that are sometimes a little difficult to get along with, and, and things of that nature. And it's hard to love sometimes with a pure heart. So we've got to get past, I think, the personalities, in a sense, of brothers and sisters and their little problems that they have in that sense, and, and just look a little deeper into their soul and into their mind and love them because of their love for God. And, and to look over that and love them anyway. Love them because of their spiritual, you know. Uh, and that's, I think that's really uh, an important uh, way to look at that. Agape love, that's what we need to have for our brothers and sisters. The kind of love that God had for us when he sent his son to die on the cross. The kind of love Jesus had when he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Wow. Could we do that? That's like hard to do, it? <laughs> Anyhow, that's uh Well, we know we got growing to do. Can we not? Even no matter how old we are, we can still grow uh, in our spirituality and we can still grow in our love and we can have a more pure love for our brothers and sisters in Christ and for mankind in general as far as that's concerned. Praying for everybody. Bow with me. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the day and thank you for all your wonderful blessings.